Hello and welcome to a very special Wall Street Wildlife Investing Podcast. Today is episode 52. And Christoph, do you know what 52 weeks add up to? They add up to one round trip around the sun, dear badger. They do, sir. One trip around the sun and the end to our one-year King of the Jungle portfolio challenge. You say that with a stupid smirk on your face. <laughs> wow. Take an advantage. Take an advantage of a humble monkey who's not only got his ass whooped, but also didn't sleep at all last night because of the U.S. election. And there you are, gloating and gleaming about your very sizable victory, about which we will talk about nonstop. But in case uh, you're just listening to this and not seeing our video. I am wearing my bare red assed baboon hat uh, <laughs> in part, I guess, from the spanking that I uh, got and maybe will get on this episode. That baboon's ass is firmly red and I'm ready for a spanking. And I'm going to give it a spanking today because you didn't just lose, you lost magnificently. Oh, did I ever. <laughs> and dear listener, like a preview of some of the numbers that we're going to share today. Like in today's episode, we are going to take you through our conclusions on the first year of the King of the Jungle Portfolio Challenges. We'll talk about our biggest investing successes, our biggest mistakes. Would you believe we both bought the same company and got totally opposite results? In today's episode, we'll explain how that mysterious thing could have happened and propelled me to a winning finish line. Yeah, if you want to see some dark magic, <laughs> we got it for you. Quick note at the top of the show is that the King of the Jungle portfolio lives live on WallStreetWildlife.com. So if you want to see the historical data and the up-to-date holdings in our portfolio and the ups and downs of our portfolio value, go check that out there. And above all, welcome to our two latest Patreons, Kurt K and Julian G. God bless your hearts. You're going to help us make the show better. And now on Patreon lives our PDF for the 10 laws of the investing jungle. So check that out and you can mark off how many of those laws I violated in year <laughs> one of the <laughs> King of the Jungle portfolio. Well, let's do a quick reminder of what the King of the Jungle portfolio was, because if you're tuning in on episode 52, like if nothing else, you've got a whole year's worth of nonsense to listen to. But if you can't be bothered, the TLDR is when Christoph and I launched this podcast, we decided to have a real money investment challenge. And this is really like a 10, 20 year, like a lifetime challenge. But we thought we'd measure our results after a year just to kind of see how it played out. And that's what we're reviewing today. We put a thousand US dollars in each of our accounts to get us started. We added a hundred bucks in real money every month and we just had invested it as we saw fit. And here we are a year later checking in on the results. Yes. Uh, and the results are as of uh, one year around the sun, starting November 1st of 2023, the difference <laughs> between our two portfolios, a whopping 849 rotten bananas. But I can explain. I can explain. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to hearing it. Yeah. Hey, Christoph, if you had to sum up your year of the King of the Jungle in one word or one emoji, what would it be? I would I, Allow me uh, three words. Mistakes were made. <laughs> okay okay but, is, there, is, there, is there a baboon's ass emoji i don't know but but also this is important in investing mistakes always get made it's a manner of of uh negotiating them and this is where we'll get into the nuance of what i'm gonna uh, adapt and what I'm going to stick to, which might look like a mistake now, but I still suspect might not be a mistake. So we have to we have to nuance that a little bit. But before we before we continue, I think it would be shame for me not to present you with a hard earned and well deserved victory prize. And here Ooh. it is. You are 
<laughs> the new recipient of the Top Banana Award. That is beautiful. I'm going to have to virtually accept it because we are literally 12 time zones different. I'm a long way away from you in uh, Texas right now, but I appreciate the Top Banana and I look forward to receiving it by DHL as soon as I get home. <laughs> Yes. I wonder what I'm going to get next year when I come back with a vengeance. The pleasure of buying me yet another banana, and I'll have a whole bunch after five or six years. <laughs> <laughs> but you were very kind, and uh, I'll share a couple of photos at the back of today's episode. But uh, Katrina and I had a very fancy dinner at your expense just uh, two days ago when we banked the win. So we thank you for our Lobster barbecue and champagne. Beautiful. Right. Lobsters and champagne. <laughs> you did not spare. You did not <laughs> spare poor humble monkeys uh, bank. That's for sure. But you deserved it. So shall we? Shall we get into figuring out what went right, what went wrong on both our ends and what we're going to try to do better for round two? Let's do that. I mean, maybe the best place to start is we'll pop some of the numbers up on screen. But let's just talk about our biggest wins and losses to get things started, shall we? Yeah, absolutely. And actually, right before getting to that, I'm sorry, um, I want to mention uh, that the way we're going to do this, you already alluded to this a little bit, but we did year one. So we marked that that's closed and we're, we aim to repeat yearly competitions while keeping the overall portfolio. We're not going to reset the overall portfolio. So that's going to continue showing our overall performance over the many years but for each additional year, we'll just measure the gains for that year from the endpoints of that year. So it, it should be actually pretty straightforward to keep track. Yeah. And look, I don't turn this into like an election conversation. You've, you're looking pretty sleepy over there because you've been glued to the election. And I've, I've been glued to it by the pool all day today. I do know in our portfolios, I have Chinese auto manufacturer BYD and you've got Tesla. Well, uh, our new president has firmly put the ball in your court with that little pairing of uh, auto manufacturers. Right. We swore that we wouldn't talk elections today on this episode, in part because everyone's probably either crying or exhausted or, you know, gloating. But we, uh, we do have things to say about the election. So check us out in the next episode, especially how the results will weigh in on investing strategies going forward. But you're right, I slept for maybe two hours last night. So if I say nonsensical things this morning, that's not because I don't, well, <laughs> you, you decide why, why I've said nonsensical things. But Okay, let's, uh, let's pick up some numbers. Do you want to kick us off with your best performer? Yeah, uh, my best performer was EOS Energy, which makes long storage duration batteries for the electrical grid. And it was one of my two main big positions that I've held all year and continued to add as the price dropped. So at one point, EOS was down to seven, 70 cents a share. I kept lowering my average, uh, my average cost basis and I finished the year up 180% plus some additional gains on some of the options I bought. But that position was the biggest winner in both our portfolios combined. The color I want to add to that to use analyst language from investing calls is that this is on the back of me having done a stupid amount of research for a very, very, very long time. So um, normally I would not make this kind of bet and I would not keep adding to it as it kept going down and down and down and the sizable amounts that I did. But in this case, I think I knew what I knew. I was confident in what I knew and I was not going to let the market uh, noise confuse me. Very good. Well, my big winner wasn't too far behind that. About 171% gain over the year from one of my favorite stocks in my own real money portfolio too, Rocket Lab. Peter Beck's uh, space systems company, putting stuff into orbit, but delivering like end-to-end -end space solutions right now. And Rocket Lab was interesting in the King of the Jungle, right? Because it was the big winner for me, but it was your undoing a little bit. What went wrong? What went wrong? 
uh, Badger, is that additional, more additional context is needed here. If you remember early in the year of last year, I was very concerned about the macroeconomic conditions. I still am, by the way, but that's a whole separate conversation. And in order to find ways of existing in the market while these conditions still, you know, uh, were there, I attempted to learn about short-term trading and using technical analysis and more kind of momentum-ish trading. Trading. So not long-term investing, but trading. And one of the companies that I learned live with was Rocket Lab because you and I both share a bullish thesis. And then what I was seeing on the charts uh, encouraged me. So I bought short-term options. And I, know I there's a bunch of stuff. I don't think this is the time and place to explain the nuances of the trade. But long story short is that when you buy short-term options, you're m- making a bet that has many things that could go wrong. And the market is kind of controlled not by the fundamentals of the company, but by call it price manipulation or price action. And all of my calls for Rocket Lab ended up expiring at zero. One side note, I don't know how you feel about this, but it is interesting that neither of us copied each other's companies at all during this uh, competition, even though we don't have any rules that say we can't do that. This was the only instance where we both, you know, really were bullish on Rocket Lab and I wanted to make more money quickly. You said you were fine with a few shares for the long term and the result is egg on my face and you're up 171%. Yeah, like to bring an animal analogy in, like I was the tortoise. I bought my stock. I thought I'd let it simmer like a slow cooked stew. Whereas you were like this chef with a flamethrower trying to whip up a five-star meal in 10 seconds flat. And unfortunately, your uh, your flan collapsed. Your Rocket Lab stock barely got off the launch pad. Yes, uh, that's exactly what happened. Here's the slightly more nuanced picture for the future. Overall, my options strategy in this first year cost me a significant chunk of, of bananas. 500 something really i th- i don't think it's necessarily that there's no spot for that strategy i just think it has to be applied probably later in the career of a portfolio not like when when the base is still so thin and uh it has to be done i think with a smaller portion of the capital so i have adjustments to make let's like pull out some investing lessons that we've learned over the course of this year like you and i have been investing for over 20 years each like you're something like 28 years in the market i've been investing in growth stocks for about 21 years i mean like this investing is like a lifelong journey of learning and improving and trying to refine our processes and I, I think that's a good insight that if you are starting, essentially, you know, we're artificially starting from scratch here with our King of the Jungle portfolios, like a relatively small amount of money, only a couple of thousand bucks now, that kind of works okay when you're buying equities, particularly if you're using a, a platform that allows fractional trading where you can buy, you know, a tenth or even a, a 1% of a share. You don't have to even buy a whole share. But with options, I guess you're kind of, the price of entry, like your starting price to buy a contract could be more expensive than a portfolio of that size can warrant. So, you know, not only is that a strategy for a more advanced investor, it's probably not something you should be playing around with if you, you know, if you have less than a five figure portfolio. Absolutely. I'll put this point blank. You know, our audience, I think there's a wide range of listeners, but we gear toward being uh, guides toward the beginner, beginners or investing curious, playing with options, you just should not do it in the first, I would say, few years of your investing journey at all. Because investing is plenty hard to do on its own. There's plenty of work to be done on all kinds of levels. And options are like really graduate level stuff. And you could see that even though I put a lot of time and effort into my strategy, 
uh, they backfired. And that could be very discouraging if you have that kind of outcome early in your career. And that might lead to an even worse error, which is you might say investing is impossible or you can't win or whatever. And that's absolutely not true. And why Badger's wisdom here is, is really sound. No options for beginners. If we look at my portfolio for the year, I've got it on screen now. If you look across my portfolio, I've only actually had one loser out of my 11 investments. And that loser was Zscaler, cybersecurity, zero trust. Guys, like I've got a nice range of winning investments, only one that was over 100% return Rocket Lab. But my Palantir stock up 80%, Mercado Libre up 61%, Axon up 80%, CrowdStrike 66%. Like there's a ton of good winners there. And I think this does bring to life, I've had a good year, no argument, but this does bring to life that you can beat the market. You don't have to make it complex. It can be as simple as my maxim is find the world's greatest companies, buy them and hold them for a long time. Yeah. And that's the strategy you and I have grown to love and depend on. Uh, So it works over time. The one caveat I want to add is that you had the tailwinds that the market was cooperating with you. So you bought great companies, but great companies are rarely cheap, but the market supported you. That's not always going to be the case. And it's, you know, I thought that that wasn't going to be the case. So I looked in the value section of the market where I was looking at cheap companies. So when it works, which is usually, right? Usually, statistically, most years are up and statistically, most years there is the win that you're back. Badger's strategy and mine usually, the buy great companies, hold them for the long-term works. But it's not as simple as that. It's, if only that were true like every single year, you know? So we'll see what year two brings. Do you want to just give us a, like the 10,000 foot view of your own portfolio for the King of the Jungle and like how that aligned with the strategy you planned? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I already spoke about it some that I was really scared about the market being overly heated and with lots of bad economic data. So based on a lot of research, I found two companies that I thought were massively undervalued and or what I think of as uncorrelated from the market. One of them was the biggest success uh, in EOS. The other one is a biotech in Coherus. And those two are the ones I kept adding to throughout the year. EOS worked out. Uh, Coherus ended up down f- over 50%. And that's as I continued adding in dollar cost averaging. One reason I did that is because not only do I did I think and continue to think that Coherus is massively undervalued, but as a biotech, biotechs in general, play by different rules from from uh, market ups or downs. Why? Because the success of the company more or less depends on whether the drugs they're making get approved or not, and that's irrelevant from the market. And the speed, if you will, or operational efficiency at selling the drugs once they're approved. So whether the market goes up or down, if you pick the right call it molecule to invest in, you're going to have wild successes. So that's what I wanted to to position myself in deliberately. I didn't want to be at the whim of the market. I did the same thing for Relay Therapeutics, though not in as big a size. And Iris Energy became a big winner for me throughout the year because that was a bet on Bitcoin and the AI data center movement. But all four of those were, were... sort of, yeah, deliberately outside the market, if you will. Only Tesla, which was a small position, is the kind of company both of us would own, you know, long-term, that's very expensive, but we still think it's a long-term hold. Yeah, absolutely. Tesla's like a mainstay holding in my real money portfolio. It is actually one I I avoided it in King of the Jungle because you owned it. I thought I'd just, I've got a whole wealth of great companies to invest in. I thought I'd pick the ones that you hadn't picked. But if you didn't own it, I'd definitely have it in my King of the Jungle portfolio. And I did play, you know, 
at the beginning of this contest for the first year, you know, we're sort of wet behind the years because we didn't know, you know, how it would go, how it would unfold, especially since you and I are schooled in the same principles. What was cu- most curious to me is that we really took as opposite strategies as you could take in this first year, which oh, sort of, you know, in hindsight surprised me because I did not intentionally like think I'm going to, I wasn't like set on being contrarian exactly. It's just that as I was looking at things and evaluating things, my perspective made more and more sense to me at the time. And then as the year went on, I had, I don't know, uh, less reason to abandon my strategy. And then we just ended up polar opposites strategy wise, right? I don't know if that's, that's going to continue to be the case. I doubt it. Because, you know, my, I have an exit strategy. I don't want to hold my sort of shittier companies for forever. I'm just, I'm going to sell them when they regain their more reasonable valuation. So it's not like, you know, right. I'm not, although, yeah, the, I guess maybe the more, more important point, tell me if you agree with this for listeners, and we'd love to hear your perspective on this. It made for a more interesting show, potentially, right? Yeah, we were both really divergent, and I, I didn't touch options. I did a little bit of options uh, gambling. I consider it gambling for real, but that's even that's I consider that like a separate portfolio, which is more about entertainment than investing. I don't know enough about options, certainly not enough to use them in the King of the Jungle portfolio challenge. But I did want to use my King of the Jungle portfolio to mirror the approach I've taken in the last 21 years, because I haven't changed my approach. I, th- I figured out what works for me, and I figure I'll stick with that, hopefully till the day I die. Right. One, one caveat to the original question you asked me, I did know that I wanted to have a more motley uh, toolkit. That's why I not only did options, but I also experimented with the technical analysis. But if you remember at the beginning of the show, I had a position in Chainlink, which is my highest conviction investment in real life. Uh, but the problem was that SoFi deactivated their crypto portfolio stuff. And SoFi is the platform I chose to create for this contest. So I was forced to sell it. And now in year two, I'm, because Trump just won and because crypto now has a new life, new lease on life, I need to figure out how to get more direct crypto exposure for King of the Jungle because I have such uh, strong conviction in the two holdings that I own. So we need I need to negotiate that for year two, how I'll, I'll do that exactly. I think there's a couple of other lessons to be learned from both of our approaches this year. Maybe we could reflect a little bit on anything we learned from each other. And like cash is king. I love cash and I consider it to be a position. It's not just dead money in my real portfolio. And maybe I brought that a little too heavily as a lesson for myself into the king of the jungle. Like I'd kind of forgotten the reason why I have nearly a 20% cash allocation in my real portfolio. It is a hedge against maybe macro or the political environment turning against me. But I've also got that much cash just because like my portfolio pays the bills. And uh, if I blow myself up, like I, that could impact my lifestyle, but perhaps severely. That's not going to be the case with the King of the Jungle portfolio. If anything, my King of the Jungle money is in many ways much more longer term money than my real money portfolio, because it's still real money, but it's so small mm-hmm. in relative to everything else. It's like, I'm not going to spend it, right? So I can afford to be, I can afford to treat that as higher risk money. So I think, I think my lesson there is cash is king until it's not. I probably should have been a little more aggressive at getting some of that cash into play and maybe just kept a little bit on the sidelines to give myself some optionality. My pushback on that badger will be is that, well, one, I agree with you. I love having cash because on big red market days, you actually get excited because you could buy things on sale. But I sense a lot of hindsight bias creeping in because meaning in the sense that you saying that maybe you should not, you should have invested more of it, but that's only because 
the market went up. Had the market really corrected, you would have been so glad and wished you had even more cash available. So it, that's important to note. But in general, I think we diverged in this sense because you kept cash on hand, maybe too much. Whereas I, because my investments were geared under companies that were undervalued, I always wanted to own more of them, especially as they continued dropping in their valuation and that gap continued to widen. So I had very little incentive to hold on to my cash when I knew exactly where I wanted to put it. But here's a big change we're making, I'm making for year two. I wanted to control my cash a little bit more methodically, sort of to copy you a little more. So we agreed that this second year we'll be investing $200 per month, which is still very doable, I think, for most people. And then I'm splitting that $200 into an even $50 per week. So this way I kind of measure out my purchases one a week each month. So every week I'll be buying a little something, which means that at the start of each month, I will always have $150 just waiting there. Yeah, that's good. And uh, I remember that comical conversation we had about like maybe six weeks into the contest, so nearly a year ago, and we each had a thousand bucks in the portfolio, and you were like this kid in the candy store, and you spent all your money straight away, and then you were like, we need to we need to add more money, we need to increase the amount. I'm like, dude, come on. <laughs> I've been patient. I've taken my time. I've still got some money on the sides. What are you playing at? Uh, I am a monkey. I mean, what do you what do you want? You know, or... <laughs> I want all the bananas. <laughs> so you got your wish in for year two. You got your wish. We're increasing the amount. But this is still a very accessible amount of money, we think, for our listeners. And the reason we're increasing it is, um, and I've got a, a lesson here as well, I, I think, that I knew already, but I think it's worth reiterating. Like, this might be small beans today. It's like, what, like a, a 2000 odd dollar portfolio. I can see now, if we run this competition for 10 years, let's say, which is truly like long-term investing, 20 years, 30 years, long-term investing, then it's going to turn into real money, like serious money. So a change I've made as we transition from year one to year two, I've actually moved my entire portfolio from being a general investment account into uh, the UK's version of a Roth IRA. It's called an ISA, Individual Savings Account. And it's just an investment account, but it's tax-free and you can put up to 20000 pounds a year into this thing so my king of the jungle portfolio is now like a little sidebar of my real entirely tax-free portfolio and if we keep this contest going for 10 years you know that could be it could be part of the engineering supporting my life so uh you know you definitely we're increasing the amount keeping it sensible if you if you play this well and if you follow our journey for the next 10 years like with just 200 bucks a month you too hopefully all of us will have a really a handsome amount of money to help us all towards our retirement goals. Oh, this is such an important point. Uh, in 20 years, in 20 years, 10 or 20 years, we're still going to be fit because, you know, we do our, we, we do our running, we do our jujitsu, we play our tennis, right? So these, these beautiful uh, Apollonian models that you see before you <laughs> will still be going strong <laughs> And for fifty dollars a week, I mean, really, that's the main point. Fifty bucks a week, twenty years from now or ten years from now, we'll be eating lobster rolls with champagne for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Market, <laughs> market, November sixth, twenty twenty four. This is the this is this clip right here is going viral. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. Uh, I I agree. Uh, follow us on the journey. Right, this is our one year anniversary. But actually, Christoph, it's really like. Our two-year anniversary. This is our second one-year anniversary, right? Because we've done some podcasts before. Right. Um, so I hope this I hope this brand sticks. But if it doesn't, like we'll still be podcasting under a different brand. But we'll definitely keep coming back and checking in on this King of the Jungle portfolio malarkey because, um, like, this is how you do it, guys. This is this is how I started twenty years ago. I learned some hard lessons, and we're now using the Wall Street Wildlife podcast to impart those lessons and learn new ones along with you all. Yeah. I mean, it's fun and games, but it's not because we know what we're talking about. <laughs> and especially, you know, and 
especially with mistakes because they're inevitable, right? So uh, they're not, they're, like I said earlier, they're unavoidable, but we know how to spot them. And so if you learn to trust us in the coming months and years, it's shocking how fast five years, something like five years goes by. And you'll see that little portfolio that started with a thousand bucks, all of a sudden is much, much more. And it's, it's great to uh, help empower people to, to see that it's all possible. So great stuff. Well, as we do look into year two, have you thought about not just your 50 bucks a month? Are there any other changes you're thinking about making? Or maybe a more precise question. Um, is there a particular stock you're excited and looking forward to adding as we go into round two? Yes. So the big picture is, I think I already mentioned, I'm going to slow my roll with the options. Specifically, actually, be let me be even more specific, call options, uh, because they are the most dangerous. There are other forms of options that are actually uh, conservative. For the most part, I'm going to refrain from using the options much, I think. Um, I have second piece is I'm expecting Coherus to flip, to close that valuation gap sometime in, in, in this year, this next round. I'm going to have to figure out what to do with all that cash once I trim it. <laughs> Uh, and the third point is that right now, the stock I'm most excited to start adding in in size will be Nintendo. Just uh, you heard that we, we did a quick stock safari segment on it, like a quick overview. I really, really loved what I saw. There was some recent news about it a couple of days ago. And I think this is going to be one of my better long-term holdings for the long-term aka with the stuff you're buying so stay great tuned stuff. for a deeper deeper dive great stuff and actually funny enough i've got two stocks i've also reviewed in our weekly stock safari segment that i'd like to add to my portfolio both my real money portfolio and my king of the jungle and if i look back at my at my safari stocks two that are standing the test of time on my to-do list i want to buy meta and I want to buy Games Workshop, the uh, the fantasy figure miniature Warhammer 40k guys. You, you know, I saw on our YouTube channel and our views that particular short has like a what is it? Several thousand or a thousand coming up to two thousand views, which yeah. is doing much better than the you know some of the more arcane stocks that I've talked about or we've talked about. And I wonder if there's like, that's part of the thing, like, is it um, star power or celebrity power? You mentioned, is it Henry Cavill? Uh, yes, yeah, Henry, Henry Cavill's name is attached to the potential Warhammer 40K movie or TV show that Amazon may or may not be making. Yeah, okay, right, so. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, feels like that one des deserves a place in the portfolio. Plus, hey, who you can't argue with a, four and a four or five percent dividend income yeah <clears throat> cool uh oh one more thing i, I do want to say this uh this goes back to previous questions sorry for maybe a little bit of sloppiness here badger but i realized there's a big principle holistic principle that sectors themselves go in and out of favor often so how the election affects for example clean energy investors need to be sensitive to but what i'm also seeing that two of my five companies are biotechs and I actually expect to add more because in this moment, biotechs have preposterously low valuations across the board. And they, they are th those kinds of valleys will not last very long. So um, I'm playing that contrarian card a little bit and saying when others are, undervaluing a whole sector it's ripe for picking i wonder though if i can i'm going to plug one of my own tweets from two days ago uh because i tweeted this with coherence biosciences the biotech company in mind i'm just going to read my tweet because i think it's yeah. i think it's relevant and there's a lesson in here uh watching a stock you own collapse 
and automatically assuming you made a mistake is a unconstructive cognitive bias. If hindsight helps you identify a flaw in the thesis, great learning opportunity, but stock prices can move for many reasons and huge drawdowns and extreme volatility is often simply the nature of the game with high risk investments. And I'm thinking particularly about biotech, the, almost the highest of all high risk investments. Like many of those investments will fail, some fatally never to recover. And if you're going to grow as an investor, my insight here I think was you've either got to acknowledge your emotional response and just accept, like, I can't handle the heat. These are not for me. Or you've just got to embrace the fact that, like, risk and reward go hand in hand. And if you're going to play this stuff, for me at least anyway, have a diversified sub portfolio, like a chunk of wild cash of uncorrelated high risk opportunities, like you want a bunch of bets. If you're going to make a bet on something crazy, you're better off making 10 crazy bets than one. Um, and then just like buckle in, buddy, for a wild ride. Because for no fault of your own, for no fault of the companies, sometimes this wild stuff can just be incredibly painful for your portfolio returns. Yes. And my nuanced take response to that is be careful of gathering all companies that with the label say biotech as though everything is wild and crazy because we know some of the largest market caps out there are biotechs there are biotechs specifically go through stages and there there is the gambling stage where it's just a pipe dream and maybe this thing will work yes that's a gamble with huge risk reward in coherence's case for example they have fda approved drugs already and demand for them proven already, and it's a question of commercial execution. That's not wild and crazy. That's more in line with most other companies, just waiting for the story to play out. But you have to know what you're talking about, and you have to, you know, um, you have to know the difference. We uh, we give these health warnings regularly because they are really important. But along with the the health warnings about the wild and risky stuff, we're also using the podcast to share like safer strategies that are accessible to a beginner investor. So um, today's probably not the best episode to start with if you're really just starting out your investing journey. Next week's and the weeks after that will be because uh, that's where we'll be starting round two of the King of the Jungle and continuing our journey. So if you haven't, subscribe. And if you want to go read our 10 laws of the jungle, go find them at patreon.com slash wallstreetwildlife. You can also find Christoph and I on all the social medias, but our favorite place to chat is Twitter slash X, where I am at seven Luke Hallard. I am at seven flying platypus. And my uh, new favorite place to chat is actually on our Patreon page because it's really clean and it's sort of the place for our inner tribe. It's where our, our people live. And that's where if you ask a question, leave a comment, I will get back to you toot sweet. So check us out there and if you've got if you've got us on the podcasts like you can see our furry faces if you swing by youtube slash at wall street wildlife maybe just go give us a subscribe there anyway because it kind of helps our numbers we're uh, we're trying to grow the youtube channel and like we're definitely getting great conversations going on our youtube videos so you've got something you want to ask like drop us a note there we made a whole episode out of a question from a listener just a few weeks ago yeah our community is growing I think uh, our experience is showing in our, and we're looking forward to year two of this journey. Uh, I hope, if nothing else, the spanking isn't as severe, but I'm uh, <laughs> this, I don't know if I could handle another such severe spanking, but I'm really up optimistic, the optimistic badger. I think I got you right where I want you for this, <laughs> for this competition. Well, you, uh, you, you, if my maths is right, you successfully turned... Uh, $2,200 into an end result of $1,600. So yeah, if you can keep compounding at that rate. Uh... <laughs> yes, mistakes were made, but it, but it's temporary. It's all temporary. Well, I mean, it just remains for me to thank you again for the uh, delightful dinner the other day. We appreciate your generosity. Thank you for the top banana award. As When you ship that to me, it's going to have pride of place next to my 
uh, Tesla tequila on the uh, the top shelf back home. And uh, I guess until next week, are you ready to become a beast of an investor? Your journey starts right here. A reminder that the people on this program may hold positions in the companies that are mentioned. Buying and selling stock carries financial risk, which could include loss of capital. The views in this program should not be taken as personalized advice. Before acting on any of the information provided, listeners are encouraged to consult a financial or tax professional.